for you found the skeleton, skeleton, how would you tell people that this happened? You first, first, first. How would you tell them? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. All right, hey everybody, welcome to another Leaving Your Earth Creationism, this time with William D. Uh, I'm, of course, as you guys know, the Dark Dinosaur, you're on my channel, if you didn't know that, why the heck are you here? Um, first, I want to say thank you to Valkyrie, who for $2.99 sent a rock and roll horns uh, super stick, that's what they're called. Thank you very much. And I am here, of course, with William D. It is in the title of the stream, so again, you shouldn't be surprised by that. William, how are you today? Not too bad. So we're here to talk about uh, leaving young earth creationism. So unless you have anything real quick you want to say, I think we should just jump into that. Yeah, I think we should. Okay, so um, tell everybody, uh, how old were you when you started to be a young earth creationist? Was it something you were raised with or did that come later? Um, I mean, I, I guess, um, I guess you could, hmm. I guess you could say raised with now. Um, I'm sure everyone's curious about this. Um, I was, this is a, uh, air filter mask. <coughs> All right, I was born with extremely severe asthma and allergies. And, um, you know, right now I live in an apartment where other people spell sometimes it literally comes through the walls, but there is actually a connection, believe it or not. Oh, <coughs> because, all right, well, just like elderly religious people tend to be more fervent in their religion because their death is near. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I grew up knowing I could die any day, so that was more, a little more fervent than average. Okay. Um, <coughs> excuse me. No, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, from the, I mean, from as I can remember, there was, um, it was, you know, like children's videos about um, like Adam and Eve's nose arc and, and stuff. Um, that, at the same time, though, I mean, at that point, I was too young to really be told there's a difference between is it literal or figurative anyway. So I'm not right. entirely sure, but I, I mean, I guess I would just go with raised with it. Okay. Um, th then, okay, so because um, I was, uh, you know, a sickly nerd um, going to public school and you know you know being bullied and stuff when i don't know i guess it was about fourth grade when a um baptist sunday school teacher told me oh well, you're gonna be told in school there's something called religion but you just need to tell them that's wrong because the bible says so don't worry about it oh odd okay <laughs> well okay on one hand i that was i knew from the very beginning that was kind of laughable because if you're trying to tell a, a teacher that doesn't share your religion that their views are wrong because of your religious text. That's not going to work. Yeah, no, not really. But at the same time, though, I mean, it means since I was um, a religious kid being bullied in um, public schools, I it was very easy for me to think, oh, well, you know, if the world believes in evolution and the world treats me so bad, well, so the world must be wrong. So it was very easy to convince me. Okay. Um, but... Um, it probably would have stayed as just an internal belief um, if um, everything I continued as it was. Um, as it turns out, um, my parents got divorced before I started high school. And I started going to a Pentecostal church with the father of a friend I had known in elementary school. Mm -hmm. It was a very small church, but in their library, they had um, books on creationism. And they told me that, oh, there's all this evidence that actually does prove, even if you don't use the Bible, can, can prove that creationism is real. Um, but the, the secular, secular scientists refuse to even look at it. But, right. oh, look at all this wonderful evidence. Um, and I didn't... Um, at that point in time, understand um, logical fallacies like um, hasty conclusion and false dichotomy. And uh, yeah, I really just swallowed hook, line, and sinker. Um, 
<laughs> so which um which books were you getting in there? Was it like uh scientific creationism, the Genesis flood, some of those things coming out of like the sixties and seventies? No. Um okay, I don't remember um the the name of the book in the church library. But I think it might have been one of the really old ones, Henry Morris. There were some facts in it that are already just from like high school. I knew, um, yeah, that's not right. But mm -hmm. I sort of figured that, well, enough of it is right for the idea as a whole to right. be true. And I didn't realize it yet, but I was getting into subjective validation. Now, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a computer programmer, but um, I know enough about psychology to realize, wow, I mean, it's amazing how much of my past behavior can be explained by some really simple psychological principles. Like, wow, I'd never realized that. Hmm. So, <clears throat> okay, so you're a kid and you're going to a, a church with a friend. Is that so before that you had been going with your parents, right? Well, uh, it was mostly my my great aunt Hazel took me to the Baptist Sunday school. Okay. Um, oh, but I forgot to answer your your question. Uh, books that I ordered were like um, uh, the Origin of Species Revisited, Volume One and Two from ICR. Okay. Um, um, oh, I forget the other, but it was, it was mostly things from. ICR and Carl Baugh that I followed. Oh goodness, Carl Baugh. Yeah, that's a he's a step down even from ICR in my book. I also I also uh, am convinced that if I had to take a Turing test to determine who was a human between Carl Baugh and the average chatbot, I would always select the chatbot as the real human and never Carl Baugh because listening to him speak, it he just sounds like an alien who never really quite figured out how humans communicate. Um, it's it's bizarre. He goes on these long-winded rants that go nowhere and don't even have like a main set. Like, try to diagram any statement, like a sentence diagram from Carl Baugh, and it's just impossible. It's all just yeah. nonsense. Um, but okay, so <clears throat> now at this time, was he was he displaying all of his weird artifacts that he doesn't let anyone catch up on, like um, like his supposed fossilized finger or his human tracks or the bowl that was allegedly found in coal. Yes, awesome. um, I, I I saw him on um, TBN presenting these things, and I bought oh yeah I bought a book from him. Why do men believe evolution against all odds and other uh, other materials? Um, you know, um, I was getting those um, impact pamphlets from um, ICR and stuff. Um, I kind of I kind of gravitated towards Carbaugh because his version of creationism seemed to me at the time to rely on physical evidence that I thought proved it to be true, um, and I didn't I didn't know that um, uh, how much evidence there was that that that, that Proof is not true, right? Um, you know, uh, SciShow Channel on YouTube did a video. It was a few years ago, but about pathological science, and they talked about why people believe things that they that aren't true. But it is it, in some cases, it's not fraud. People are really are talking themselves into believing it, right? Um, anyway, but one one category of that of all the different types of pathological science they listed was when an initial finding is made that is wrong um and there is a correction that is made and the correction is released but somehow the correction um never seems to catch up to the um the, the correction never has the same public reach as the original information right did. right that, I remember a specific one there. Um, there was a paper published about an alleged dinosaur of Oculodon and it was supposed to be the smallest dinosaur ever. It's even smaller than the, the bumblebee hunting. Because, you know, that's a dinosaur too. 
and everyone's like, oh my goodness, this is so amazing. And I'm looking at the paper, I'm like, How, why is this not a lizard, guys? And then a few months later, Little Rupert's like, oh, guys, it was probably a lizard, not a dinosaur, so we're going to retract that statement. And I still get asked about it every once in a while, like, hey, what about that? Hey, this isn't that a cool dinosaur? I'm like, no, no, oh, it's not. Yeah. A silly, a silly example is that there are a lot of people that still think that you cannot taste salt on the tip of your tongue. Um, yeah. There's yeah, the taste buds are, it is more, it, it's, it's almost like a, like a Gaussian distribution where there's more of certain types of taste buds in different areas of the tongue, but it's not like there's no salt on the tip, which that's just yeah. a silly example. That's just a silly example. Okay. In this case, in this case here, um, Okay, it turns out I think back in the '80s, um, you know, I was still um, b b before I had even started high school. Um, uh, Glenn Kubin is a programmer and judge who uh, found evidence that okay, the the dinosaur footprints in situ in the Paloxy River. Mm -hmm. uh, me, sorry, not, not the dinosaur footprints, the the man tracks. Right, are actually small eroded dinosaur footprints. At first glance, you could be forgiven for thinking that it was a human footprint, but it's not. Right. So we'll, and, uh, I'm going to give everyone a little bit of background in case there might be a few people who don't know about the Pelican tracks. So, um, famously, the Pelican River has some uh, Cretaceous uh, dinosaur tracks, including some sauropods and some various, probably like a gamimid theropods and things like that, and um. Especially during the beginning of the Depression, people started carving in fake man tracks as well as identifying theropod tracks as human tracks because they were badly eroded and they sort of formed a vague shape. And then um, when creationism started to break out of just Seventh day Adventism in like the 60s, boy, did they run away with that. They just all over that. So that's the background. There. Yeah, so um, apparently, when um, um, when um, that inf the information about the the ones that are in, in situ that could be real are just eroded dinosaur footprints and like ones like the Brodick print are definitely are carving. There's multiple lines of evidence that this thing is definitely a carving. Um, ICR and um, AIG and some other ones, some other creation ministries stopped um, mentioning it. But I, I don't know if it's because of fear of embarrassment, but um, there wasn't much said in correction of that. And uh, when Dr. Ball would go on TBN for interviews, no one ever um, would correct him and say, hey, you know, um, there's a Christian geologist who actually studied that carefully and you know, that might not be a dinosaur. I mean, that might not be a human footprint. That might be a small dinosaur footprint. It's eroded badly. And the first guys you might think is human, but it's just really not. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I have not ever seen anyone, I, as far as I can tell, who is friendly to Carl call him out. Nor do I see him frequently go onto an uh, unfriendly platform. Or not even unfriendly, just relatively neutral platforms. Uh, he's he very much a hide in his uh, echo chambery thing. And in fact, my favorite Carl Baugh oddity is um, his quote unquote hyperbaric tank of giant piranhas, which are just Aku, which is in the same family as piranhas, but they're much larger fish and they're just not outsized Paku. They're just normal sized Paku. Hmm. Which is, and it's, it's like, dude, you had to know they don't have less sharp. Bitey piranha teeth. They've got weird human looking teeth. Like it's very obvious. You know, I don't know if it's because it's been about 10 years since I left Young Earth Creationism, or if it's because um TBN never put the crazy Paku not piranha fish on the air. But I never heard of that. I did hear about his hyperbaric um his hyperbaric uh or no, he was talking about someone in Japan who had like um, hyperbaric oh, tomato. um, tomatoes. Yeah, I heard yeah, about that. Yeah, it turns out that most of that was 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 not true. 
Um, it wasn't a hyperbaric tomato. It was just a tomato that had uh, UV filtered sunlight on it. Which, okay, that's great. And it was also, if I remember correctly, like, had carefully controlled, like, fertilizers and whatnot. And yeah, it was a bit of a novelty attraction. And the thing is, no one in the history of botany has ever said that if you give plants ideal conditions, they'll grow better. That's, that's never been a claim. Like, everyone has always known that, yes, you could give a plant the absolute perfect conditions, and it will grow much larger than it normally would in most settings, including just in your garden. And so that's, that's like the entire stick, is it's like, yes, tomatoes will grow better if you carefully control them, their environment for optimal growth. This is not surprising to anyone. Huh. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I did not know that even, even till today. Um, um, yeah, hmm. I don't know if uh, Carbaugh was lying or um, if he was confused. He seems, I mean, to me, he seems to be sincerely deluded. I, I might be wrong. I, it's hard for me to tell. It's hard for me to tell with a lot of professionals. The ones who have the degrees, I'm pretty confident that they know better and that they think that the lie is worth it if it keeps people in the faith or something like that. But when it comes to people like Carl Baugh, who don't have any background in the science and who make such outlandish claims, it's hard for me to believe that someone knowing better even could make that claim. Then I, I get like, uh, maybe he is sincerely deluded and he's just bad at, well, everything, I guess, except getting donations, since he seems to be pretty great at that. Um, yeah. Okay, so we got Carl Baugh is a pretty big influence and ICR, and those are sort of the, say, like the, the vanguard of the first generation of young Earth creationism after it breaks out of Seventh day Adventist. Because one of the things most young Earth creationists do not like to admit is that their ideas were basically invented by Ellen G. White. They don't like to admit that because, well, most of them think of her as a false prophet. And they think of the Seventh day Adventists as only sort of like, kind of Christian. They're, they're a little iffy. Um, but it is really the case that, like, there's a reason that the oldest Young Earth Creationist University are all Seventh-day Adventist universities, like Loma Lit. So. Yeah, um, by the way, um, Paulogia and um, Phil Vischer did a video on that, which goes into really great depth. Just by the way. Yeah, I did see that. That, is, that was a really good um and interestingly enough, a channel that I don't actually watch very often, it's actually a, a Christian apologetics channel, also did a pretty thorough breakdown on the history of um, young earth creationism emanating out of uh, Seventh-day Adventism. Now, to be fair, that's because this particular Christian apologist is not a young earth creationist. In fact, I believe he's a theistic evolutionist, so he has absolutely no time for the, the, the weird pseudoscience of the likes of Karl Baugh or, uh, you know, Antovin or something. Um, so yeah, that oh, was... by the way, I just remembered, um, um, Starlight in Time by Russell Humphreys was another, um, oh, okay. book, an another book. That's one of the earlier ones that I haven't actually read. Um, I've read, yeah. I've read Evolution, the Fossils Still Say No, which is just Evolution, the Fossils Say No with like an addendum. Um, I've read Scientific Creationism by Henry Morris. Um, I've read Genesis Flood by Whitcomb and Morris. Um, and I've seen a whole bunch of Carl Baugh stuff. But yeah, I haven't, have not gotten around to getting a copy of a Starlight, the Distant Starlight in Time. Is that the name of it? By I, I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so this was, when you were learning this stuff, that was through what, high school? Um, well, high school and, um, Broward Community College. And, um, even though I was more focused on my studies and not, um, like doing much reading on young earth creationism all the way through the university of Florida. Wow. Um, well, remember I was talking about psychology. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I now realize it comes under something called the backfire effect. Um, like anytime anyone would try to persuade me that um, 
creation was not true would make me fundamentally unpersuadable. Um, <coughs> yeah, well, that is a, that's a common uh, thing, which is that, especially with closely held beliefs, any yeah. information that contradicts it is usually results in people return, retreating further back into that belief rather than weakening the which is paradoxical. Um, it, it means one of the things that often has to happen in order to correct beliefs is there usually has to be some kind of change to the person's emotional state or a willingness to separate certain ideas that work for their identity from their identity, and no, that's easy. Yeah. So then, you managed to stay young Earth creationist through college, which actually not not a whole lot do. Uh, there's a lot of people end up leaving young Earth creationism sometime between like the latter years of high school and uh, throughout uh, their their first four years of college. So, what was it that first made you decide to like think, hey, maybe this isn't actually all true? Was there some first little clue? Well, there were a few things. Um... One thing is kind of like um, that book, um, The Fossils Still Say No. Um, mm -hmm. was by, that was by Dane Gish, right? I believe that was Dane Gish, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I noticed that a lot of, um, a lot of um, the time, um, young earth creationists were just armchair core backing, oh, no, no, those new results shouldn't be interpreted that way. They should be interpreted this way so it'll, so it'll fit. Well, like, okay, guys, I mean, okay. Um, I mean, if you think that's your ministry to help Christians um, reinterpret science to fit your interpretation of the Bible, okay. Um, but, yeah, that's not really... Um, very productive. It, it did get to the it starting to seem like, hmm, it almost seemed like they're, they're not working with the evidence. They're not even uh, working around the evidence. They're working against the evidence, maybe. Um, yeah, that's actually one of the things that's a common criticism for a lot of young Earth creationists, that they, they do essentially no primary research, and what primary research yeah. that they do do that they manage to do well enough to get published is... Fairly trivial for the most part. It's... Yeah. Well, that brings me to an, another point. Okay. <laughs> ICR did some research, which I give them credit for at least, you know, going out and doing something. They had their rate project for trying to measure True. how much radioactive decay has occurred. And, um, okay, I bought the DVD for that. And this was, hmm. I'm not sure if this was just before I graduated. I think this might have been just before I graduated University of Florida. Um, and, um, or just added, but I think it was just before. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, now, I think this DVD was primarily intended for Christians. It wasn't necessarily trying to reach out to people outside, per se. Well, that's another thing creationists are notorious for, is making things that are almost entirely inward-facing. Yeah. Um, and one of their scientists on the um, on the DVD, um, <laughs> well, had this, actually they had this graph in the video, which was not a graph of um, uranium or lead or helium. It was a graph of like um, verb tenses in the Bible, showing that Genesis one. Um, by the verb tense is in the second most historical head. Um, but we did this because, um, you know, if the Bible um, isn't actually saying this, then we might not have a leg to stand on. I'm like, what? Yeah. Yep. But that really shocked me because, oh, yeah, in scientific creationism, um, like Henry Morris and others always said, you know, you can. Um, you can prove creationism without ever needing to touch the Bible. Um, 
you know, you can have biblical creationism that goes towards science and scientific creationism that leads you towards the Bible and they, um, you know, they can meet in the middle, but you don't actually need the, the Bible. Um, and one of these um, scientists was saying otherwise, which I, I guess it was an off script moment, but um, they, they've uh, been tamping down on those lately. Yeah. Yeah. But um, that did give me some pause. I mean, even though I, I very strongly believe that um, the young earth interpretation of Genesis was the correct one. I mean, I never thought that, no, you're going to go to hell if you interpret it otherwise. Um, right. But um, still, I believe that, like, the cup, you know, found in coal and the, um, you know, the hammer found in Cretaceous rocks. Oh, goodness, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the London uh, hammer. Yeah, and the... Um, and the um, the man tracks and all. I actually got a five on the exam, but then when I w went to college, um, I was taking a lot of math classes first, and then eventually I decided to change my major out of biology, uh, both for, for two reasons. One is because, unlike some other creationists, I never enjoyed arguing. I just don't. Just don't enjoy it. Yeah, that's fair. I just didn't want to just argue with the rest of my life, even though I was completely sincere impossible to persuade me otherwise i just did not enjoy arguing i just did not um so i bounced around from um computers to physics and back to computers and now i'm a computer programmer but uh, another reason is that i mean i kind of wanted to be um you know like those um environmentalists on tv to go to the, to the rainforest and stuff and with my health problems that's not going to happen you know yeah yeah that is it's it's fortunate, but yeah, unfortunately, things like that will will greatly limit what kind of field work. Yeah. So anyway, though, but I, I, I was thinking trying to get what changed my mind. There was um, a PBS um, documentary called Judgment Day: um, Intelligent Design in the Courtroom. I think that was the name of it. Oh, that was about the uh, Kitzmiller versus uh, case, right? I believe that's the name of it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, for for background for people, uh, Kiss Miller versus Dover was a case in which, um, basically, the case was between a school board and a, essentially the Discovery Institute. I mean, technically, there was a there was a private person who was actually a part of the suit, but like, effectively, it was the Discovery Institute. The Discovery Institute was doing stuff like getting lawyers and getting their quote unquote experts and whatnot. And so it was all about whether or not schools should be able to provide a book called Of Pandas and People. Because earlier, the Supreme Court had ruled that creationism was a religious doctrine, so it could not be taught in science classrooms. At best, you could teach it as a religious belief in, like, a comparative religions class, but it had no place in the science classroom. So then, basically, the Discovery Institute, <clears throat> trying to essentially hide the fact that this was just creationism, did a word in search and replace with your book, placing the word creationist with intelligent design proponent and the word God with intelligent designer. So they screwed it up, leaving one instance of a C design proponentists. And uh, unsurprisingly, they were uh, more or less laughed out of the classroom. The, the judgment from the judge who was in fact a political conservative was, I believe a Bush one appointee. He was pretty scathing in his decision. So that's the background there for the, the kids versus Dover case, in case you guys aren't familiar. Yes. Now, um, um, when I watched that, um, well, initially, um, I was um, actually pretty angry, uh, but not for the reason you might think. Um, as a, um, you know, a, a sincere young earth creationists with a uh, persecution complex, I had accepted that, no, we're never going to get, um, you know, the truth taught in public classrooms, at least not in my lifetime. That wasn't what bothered me. <laughs> what bothered me was that, um, okay, you may be aware that ultimately the only, um, the only, um, Intelligent design advocate that actually did testify was Michael Behe. I spoke to him about that not that long ago. 
Oh, awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, there were others that were going to. Um, but, okay, in the documentary, I just said they wanted um, the concessions that are not, not normally um, permitted in the courtroom. Um, it was, was not allowed by the judge, so they didn't, which made me kind of angry that they couldn't get more of them in there. I found out later what they wanted was everyone that wanted to have their own lawyer to advise them not to say anything that might be too embarrassing, which mm. the judge is like, come on, you're not on trial. You're just here to give, you know, supposed expert testimony for one side. You're not on trial. You don't need a lawyer, <laughs> which, um, you know, I think the fact that Michael Behe was the only person who did it without being able to have his own um, legal consultant shows his sincerity. Oh yeah, I agree. I think Michael B. is sincere. And the other ones, I don't know if they're insincere or cowardly or both, but. Mm. Well, so the thing is, if you're going on the witness stand, the only real legal trouble you're likely to get into is perjury. And so what that tells me is that while Michael Behe might be quite sincere, I think a few of the other ones at the Discovery Institute, um, they, they know that at least some of the things they say aren't actually true. And they just tell these little quote unquote white lies because, I mean, it's going to help the cause of Christ or something. I maybe I'm, I'm not maybe I don't know. Anyhow, though, but the thing, the thing, the thing in that video that eventually led to me leaving creationism is there was. Um, one science educator um, who said that, um, you know, if something is not falsifiable, you know, then it cannot be science. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, you know, going through um, UF and even back um, in high school um, in AP Bio, I knew about like null hypotheses and Karl Popper and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, since I've been introduced to, um, Young Earth creationism, even before that, I just thought that, well, you know, I mean, the evidence proves it. It must be true. <coughs> so, okay, initially, I just sort of uh, tried to push out my mind and say, well, even if the general principle is that something has to be falsifiable to be scientific, you know, we, we have direct evidence creation, so it must be true, it must be true. But it just kept haunting me. It just kept haunting me. So eventually I said, okay, I wanted to test it. I, um, what would I need to make creations and be falsifiable. And I decided I would have to um, see a, a new species emerge. Okay. Um, because, you know, when it comes to fossils like Dan Gish and the fossils say no and still say no, they're always going to armchair quarterback that to reinterpret it, whatever. So I actually just Googled speciations <laughs> and i was actually impressed with uh Dabinsky's fruit flies but um in the process of of doing that that research um you know i finally allowed myself to look at talk origins which um as part of my persecution complex i thought oh i'll send you a website to get oh yeah that's, that. that's like forbidden fruit right there yeah um and I guess not having confidence in my own self to be able to and recognize truth and falsehood. I don't know. But anyway, though, but I finally looked at that and there was a, there was a lot of talk on there about, um, about um, Glenn Cooper's website. But I never, never found the URL, but one place it had his, his email. So you know, he, he sent me the URL of his website. Mm -hmm. And um, when I realized that, I was really um, amazed. Like, oh, so um, that hammer in Cretaceous rocks looks just like the size and shape of hammers used to build the Transcontinental Railroad. And if a hammer gets lost and falls into a pool of mud with a whole lot of lime and other calcium chemicals, it can concrete around it. You can get... <laughs> Yeah. Really? Calci oh. Calcium concretions are like one of the more famous young earth creationist bafflers. They're like, look at this petrified teddy bear. It's like, dude, it's calcium concretion on a teddy bear. That's all it is. It's the same stuff as the scum on your uh, faucet if you have hard water. That hard white stuff, 
it's exactly the same thing. Yeah, and like the that um, that um, iron cup that was claimed to be found in coal. Um, well, it's, it's it's the size and shape of cups used by um, tin guards and smelters in the eighteen hundreds, and in a mining environment, well. Um, artifacts sometimes fall down a mine shaft, get covered in coal slag. The coal slag can harden around it. It's perfectly explainable. Um, yeah, it's funny how you never open up a pristine seam of coal to find a bowl in it. It's always a, pole, a, a seam of coal where people have been mining. There's been reworking of it and everything. You ever like go exploring for coal and just happen to find you know hammers and teacups and bowls and whatever. Buck uh, revision for one nine says. Not a real fossil pickle. Yeah, Carl bought. Uh, actually, no. I think this is Ken Hoven. Has an alleged fossil pickle. I don't know how he managed that determination because it just looked like an yeah. oblong rock to me. But what do I know? I haven't examined it in person. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and um. So I mean, Glenn Kubin, Um. Oh, you know, his website has HTTPS. I hope he gets that um, changed because Google is actually trying to get rid of websites that don't have the S. Mm. Sadly, but it's such a great under underutilized resource. Um, he goes through like there's like all those um, alleged claims, and um, basically all of them are easily explainable. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> So it did it sort of feel like the the Carl Ball rug had been pulled out from under you. Yeah, um, which it's it's interesting because when I found this information, I finally came to Brazil. Well, said that part of the creation is false. I mean, it was like just stunned silence in my mind for like um, a day and a half or so, and then like every time that the the subject of like. Creation versus evolution would come to my mind, mind for about a month and a half. It was just the inner monologue was high. I was just stunned. Like, yeah. Wow. So, um, I that. So, how'd you feel? Like, it was. It must have been a pretty shocking thing. Did you tell uh, your well, creationist friends and family or? That is an interesting th point. Um, I was stunned um, to the point of mental silence, but um, really the only thing was that I was kind of afraid if I was becoming liberal in this one area, would I eventually become liberal in other areas and lose faith in God? Other than other than that, um, honestly, it didn't really make a big of a deal to me. Um, and I think you know, I told some of my family and, and friends, and it wasn't a really big deal to them either. It's like, like, okay, you went from um, being a young earth creationist to an uh, oldest creationist to a theistic evolutionist. To, so what? Yeah, I mean, that is a broad thing in, in Christianity. Most Christians are theistic evolutionists. For most of them, it's just like, okay. Yeah. Uh, although it's interesting. <laughs> Fully a decade later, um, when I changed um, political parties, a lot of my friends, especially the ones on Facebook, were very hateful about that. Mm. Although, you know what? I just realized it was just like earlier today, thinking about what I was saying. Is anybody? I just realized this. All right, because young Earth creationism was something based on really deeply rooted and sincerely held religious beliefs. I never, um, you know, I never really went out and tried to persuade anyone else not to believe in it. I knew that it might be impossible. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there were some times on Facebook where I, like I saw a, um, an article for a, 600 million euro sponge or sponge rate organism and i posted a on facebook oh isn't this interesting um i don't think anyone even replied <laughs> um okay. but um 
I never actually really tried to persuade anyone. Um, so I, I knew for some of them it might be they might be unpersuadable. Whereas right. for politics, even though you, maybe it does have more life applications, it, it was something that I believe was the right approach based on based on facts, evidence, statistics, based on what I th- I at that time believed would be better for so- <coughs> excuse me. Would be better for society. So um in that case I actually tried to say, hey, I found evidence that proves I was wrong and tried to reason with some of my um friends and well not all of them, but some of them were quite hateful about it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's interesting that you got more pushback on the, the politics and the young earth creationism. I mean, I guess it does it is of more immediate impact, right? Like, what the government does is going to affect you a lot more than how old you think the Earth is in terms of your day to day life. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that is true, and it is one of the things that um sometimes people ask me, like, hey, what does it matter if someone believes that the Earth is six thousand years old? And <clears throat> the thing is, on its own. It doesn't really matter. On its own, it's it's pretty relevant. But one of the things that I, I point out now, especially, is if you look at um, if you look at Christian Ministries International. Um, Christian Ministries International is basically just AIG that survived after Ken Ham split and took away like half of their assets in a divorce. Um, it's <clears throat> it was. The same organization, but now it's not. And the thing is that unlike AIG, they took a pretty strong pro-vaccine approach during the pandemic. And a lot of their user base were very angry about this. And to their credit, they stuck to their guns and they said, no, this is where the science is and this is the safest thing to do, you know, exceptions for like if you're immunocompromised or something. But for most people, you absolutely should go get vaccinated um, and get boosted when those are recommended and yeah a whole lot of their audience was very not happy and they were trying to say like why are you guys so upset about this is this where the science goes and um to some extent myself but more so dr dancer and cardinal friend of the channel was going onto their social media and being like why are you surprised about this you have spent decades telling people not to trust scientists that the mainstream of science as they so call it is untrustworthy and lying to you. Because if it's not, then why are they promoting all this evolution stuff? It's obviously a lie, according to you. So now you're surprised that people don't trust the scientists. I mean, is it entirely their fault? No, but like, there's a lot of evidence that shows that once you believe one conspiracy theory, you're more likely to believe others. And once you start rejecting expertise because you think that expertise is suspect in its own, you're likely to reject it in other parts of your life. And so every kind of pseudoscience is dangerous. Even if on its own, it might not be that bad, it still leads to a world where you reject evidence, you reject science, you reject the consensus of experts, not for any good reason, but simply because you're in that conspiratorial mindset. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it... it... Yeah, Christians do not believe that there is one or even a small group of people in back rooms twisting their mustaches, um, trying to, um, you know, promulgate the conspiracy of evolution upon the world. But um, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, when I had um, graduated from UF and was already doing some some IT work. But before I had um, given up on Young Earth creationism, uh, one time I was going through the line at the subway. Um, actually, I was doing IT work um, for um, one of the for the Institute of um, Food and Agricultural Science at UF. So I was going through the um, cafeteria, um, or I'm sorry, food court um, subway lunch line at UF still. Mm-hmm. And one of the young ladies behind the counter was saying something about um, um, some alleged creation as evidence being controversial. And um, 
you know, I wanted to defend creation, but at the same time, they find any evidence uh, that would point away from evolution, they just ignore it. Um, now, that's crazy conspiratorial thinking, mm -hmm. crazy conspiratorial thinking, but I really believed it at the time. Um, and like um, John Morris um, at ICR, um, this was an old video, um, so old that it was, um, I think I, I think I was watching it on a VHS tape, but um, John Morris claimed that before he joined his um, father's ministry at ICR, that he got a job at um, some radiometric dating lab um, to see how things were for himself. And he claimed that they wouldn't accept a sample to date without an estimate based on rock strata. And they would turn the knobs until it came out to match, which is again conspiracy. I don't know if he. Yeah, that I'm going to press X on to doubt on that one. Yeah, or I don't know. Maybe that one lab did that. Others don't. I don't know, but there is a lot of conspiratorial thinking. Um, and yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, so uh, my next question is: so after you left Young Earth Creationism. Um, did this cause problems with family who was still a Young Earth Creationist or friends on its own, or was it just the political thing that really caused tension? Um, yeah, it was only the really, really just the political stuff. Although, I mean, yeah. well, okay, like after I lost the job um, doing IT work, um, I went back to the teaching for a little while and, and um, actually got a job teaching English in South Korea and went back and forth a couple of times. And I do like South Korea. Yeah. So, I mean, I was busy with the struggle to survive and um, I wasn't really bringing it, bringing it up with my, my friends and family and they didn't. Right. I felt more strongly about it than any of them did beforehand anyway. So... Ah, okay. Okay. So how do you now feel about, <clears throat> especially um, ICR and Carl Baugh, who were your, seems like your big influences. So if, like, if you could, if you could bring, I know Henry Morris is dead, but <clears throat> let's say that, you know, you could bring him back for a little bit to give him and Carl Baugh a piece of your mind about them and their ministries, what they do and did. What would you, what would you say? Um... I would say, please look at um, Glenn Coben's website and be willing to um, consider that other biblical interpretations could be possible. Hmm. Um, I, actually, I can't recommend his website enough. It's um, really great underused, underutilized resource. Actually, Dapper, I don't know if you actually have a, I mean, I, I found your channel because um, ever since I um, came to, Recognize evolution was true. I wanted to go back and review it um, in pre Merlian synapsids and like the Ediac period were two big things I was never mm. taught much about. So, you and Jack Sweet were doing like the, the uh, Paleozoic history channel. I mean, videos that's how I found your channel. Oh, yes, yep, those are now made on this channel, and they can also find the original version over on Jackson. We, we did a whole um, history of life, and yeah, we did a, a fair bit on the uh, reptile mammal stuff when we were doing like the Permian and stuff like that. I mean, the thing is, um, so for decades, you know, we've had synapsids, which were often called mammal-like reptiles in earlier works, even through the 90s. Um, but it wasn't actually until all that long ago that we found a lot of the really good morphological intermediaries going between sort of basal parapsids through like diacinodonts and in through things like probanognathids down into like stem mammals like Jeremiah and things like that. I guess technically they're all just stem mammals, but stem mammals that you would look at and think, eh, that looks like a mammal to me. Um, and then into actual brown mammalia in the Jurassic. Um, so yeah. it's, it is yeah. a relatively new part of paleo. Sorry. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Well, I haven't had time to go through all your videos yet, but I don't know if um, you actually have a video specifically about uh, Carl Baugh's 
creation evidence. But if, if you don't, I would recommend that you make one because I remember watching at least three, um, you know, secular nature documentaries, huh? and um, where the the topic of creationism and specifically um, the Epilepsy River did come up and some, um, you know, paleontologists said, well, we haven't had a chance to examine the, um, the uh, tracks at the Epilepsy River, but maybe they're just carvings. And this made me think, oh, the creations claim that um, we have evidence that they refuse to look at is right. That's not how it works, but I thought, I thought, I thought that at the time. Yeah. Well, I and, do have. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, Glenn Kubin um, is a great guy, but he's not um, really famous. Um, and the, um, even though some creationists stopped using the evidence, uh, they've been really quiet about any public correction. And there's a few that still do use it. Um, how much they are counting on people not having heard the correction and how much they are. I don't know, they, they may be delusional, like people that um, refuse to acknowledge that cigarettes cause lung cancer. I just refuse to believe that well. I don't know what, I don't know what category like Carball is in, but um, he still claims that's real. And some people like me hear it and believe it. So, um, and since, I mean, I can't recommend Glenn Coombs' webpage enough, but a lot of people don't find it. So I was going to say, maybe you should make some videos um, I mean, that's definitely a possibility. I have, um, I have one video specifically about Carl Baum, and um, it's actually like, it, I made it before I had finished Avatar. That's, that's how old it is. So oh. um, it's, but I could probably do more. Uh, I think what I would want to do is find some like, <clears throat> if there's any like online tours of his, of his um, museum, or um, maybe some of his videos done i know he did a uh was a creation in the 20th century or something and um but a lot of it wasn't specifically about the stuff that he had in his museum so uh yeah i, I think i might go look through and see what i can find that work in like a video slash visual medium like a youtube where i could do uh videos on that because the thing is i mean my goodness when it comes to the craziness of some of the claims he he's up there with kent hoven in terms of just like what are you talking about? What? How do you think that any of this is um, with his crazy out of place artifacts? That it's just like, like one of them's like, oh, we found this doll in a well. Yeah, it's really old. It looks like one that was made by the the natives of the area. It probably was then. Ah, but it was down amongst like the Cretaceous rocks. Like, yeah, man, in a well. Things fall. What do you want from me? Like he's got stuff like that, and it's just like, and like of course no one can ever test any of his things. Like oh, you you want to see if this oddly shaped rock that has a depression at one end is really a fossil finger? No, this doesn't look like one. That's all you should need. Well, well, it's not all I need, Carl. That's not all well, I need. Apparently, Glenn Kuhn was allowed to go into his museum and examine. Um, there's one uh I don't know if they claim claim that it came from Paluxy um or, or someplace else, but they claim it looks like um a, a, a moccasin footprint into um Oh a trilobite. Um I'm not sure if it's the same one that has a trilobite in it or not, oh, okay. but in, in any case though, um I think Lincoln was allowed to go to the museum and um not necessarily touch, but look very carefully at some of these things and um what uh Carboss says are like stitches around the edge. Well, they don't go all the way around. And also, um, you know, Glenn Cooper identified they look much more like algal concretions. Hmm. Not only that, but a a roughly um like a like an elliptical shape is maybe bent slightly mm -hmm. is a shape that you get in metamorphic rocks quite commonly. Mm -hmm. So it's probably just a like a sedimentary rock that went through some Metamorph metamorphosis in the earth and got shaped into that that kind of 
uh, I was half moon, but it's not exactly half moon, but like, uh, well, almost a foot like shape, but then it's, um, it, it's got some things near the edge that, um, kind of like little, little stitches, but they're really algal concretions. And yeah, uh, what's like, it look know, like? It's, disease, right? Everything looks like something. This, the pattern of burns on this toast looks like a Jesus. That rock looks like an elephant. Okay, great, but looks like an is aren't, aren't like you can't just use those as the same thing. Right? Looks like there's a good reason to look deeper. It's not a good reason to jump to a conclusion. Because, uh, you know, spoiler alerts, hey guys, that rock probably isn't a hell of a, even though it looks like one. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, if you just wanted to look at um, um, Glenn Kubin's website and, you know, go over that information and expound on it some more. I mean, that's a video that I would watch even if there was no um, like Carl Bob video in your video. I'm just saying, I will watch that. I mean, okay, yeah, I, mean, I could do that too. I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll look around, and see what I can find. And, um, I mean, the other thing is, I, I've also done things where, like, I've just gone through a website and, you know, in order to keep it audible, I'll, you know, read through the website myself and then I'll like pitch shift it or something so it's obvious that it's not me talking, it's the website. Um, because, you know, some people aren't watching, they're just, but yeah, um, and, go ahead. Um, oh, by the way, you're mentioning the that finger. Glenn Kubin even um, examined um, Carbaugh's photograph of the extra that finger, and I mean, it's clearly that if you have rock as like if you have rock that's kind of cigar shaped, that um, the less X rays are going to be able to penetrate all the way through, so you get that. Multiple yeah, star shape in the middle. It doesn't have to look like a bone in the middle at all. Yeah, you're, it's going to be you know uh, denser or middle, like just because of ten thickness and whatnot. But like you should be able to see like joints and individual bones, but can't. It's just uniformly, uh, you know, um, X rays are usually negative, so it's just uniformly gonna be brighter in the middle. Um, but I think at this point we're gonna start jumping a little bit into the Q and A. So. Uh, the way this is going to work, guys, is first, if you do Super Chat, that will move any question that you have up to the top. And, of course, it helps the channel, so I always appreciate that. Um, but if you can't or don't want Super Chat, perfectly okay. But do make sure you tag at Dapper Dinosaur, because otherwise there's a fair chance that I'll miss it. Because sometimes guys just slide across something that doesn't have that little um, orange background for me. So, um... Get your questions ready if you have them, and we do have at least uh, one super chatted question. This is from Vandalia nineteen ninety eight, and he asks for five dollars. What is the most interesting fact you've learned since leaving creation? It's a great question, I think. Yeah. Um. <laughs> it's hard to narrow it narrow it down um when it specifically comes to creationism itself the most interesting thing to me that i've realized um and i'm sorry i don't have just one fact but the most interesting thing to me is how much psychology applies to all this mm. Um, and I, I'm not an expert in psychology. I only took like one class of psychology and one class of sociology because I had you for general electives in college. I'm not an expert at all, but when right. it's that basics, it's pretty easy to see. Wow. I mean, looking back, wow. Wow. Um, <laughs> that's probably the most interesting thing as it relates to the creationism. When it comes to um, like the earth and natural history, Again, I apologize. I don't have just one single fact, but the most interesting thing I found in studies since then is the Ediacaran period, because it's just this really profound mystery of um, this really profound mystery of what were these organisms. Right. Um, now, recently, based on biomarkers, um, Dicksonia, Dickinsonia identifies almost certainly. Um, you know, a uh, 
a pro articulate bilaterian um mm -hmm. um it's still such a really profound mystery um about um the, the rangium morphs like charnia um i mean I, okay i think the um I don't know, maybe I still carry some judgmentalism with me from my past. I think that the paleontological community is a little biased towards them being animals. I mean, I agree that the idea of them being lichens underwater is kind of ridiculous, but I mean, how do we know they weren't pure fungi? I don't know. They're just so, so mysterious. Yeah. Well, one argument against the fungi is that um, uh, fungi tend not to have repeated body outs, whereas Tarnia does. So there is that oh, okay. argument. Uh, but then again, you can't actually, as far as I'm concerned, completely rule out the idea that maybe there was a fungus or a stem fungus that did evolve the ability to make repeated body section, but that didn't persist to today. So saying that our currently known fungi don't have this, it means it's probably the case that it's not a fungus. And it's definitive. I don't, I don't think it's quite definitive. I do think it is less likely than it being uh, an animal, but like, yeah, I, I do think that um, non-animal affinities for a lot of the rangiomorphs, which, by the way, don't form a clade, as far as anyone knows, they're just sort sort of generic, generic term for these very ambiguous sort of um, idiot current fossils. Yeah, I do think non-animal uh, identities are plenty possible for a bunch of them. Uh, JS asks, "What do you think of Christian science groups?" like Biologos and Reasons to Believe were more scientific in their approach? Um, I almost completely agree with them. Although, um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I was a huge fan of um, like the, the GodandScience.org um, website by Richard Dean. Um, although, I don't know, the more that I think about it, I don't really see how the evidence can prove a difference between that and theistic evolution. So why not just go with theistic evolution? I mean, um, I, as far as I'm concerned, I have no problem in particular with Biologos. Um, reasons to believe being an anti-evolution old earth group. They do tend to be about as bad at biology as any other creationist group. But yeah, I mean, look, this channel isn't an anti-religion channel, it's an anti-pseudoscience channel, and if you have a religious organization that isn't denying science, I, then whatever else you believe, I, it's not, I don't have a bone to pick with them. Like, if you're a Christian and you're not denying science, then we're good. If you're an atheist and you're not denying science, we're still good. If you're a Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, Jew, and anything else, as long as you're not denying the science, then as far as, like, me arguing against your scientific ideas, I don't care. Like, I don't really argue against, per se, your religious ideas. Um, it's not what the channel's for. The channel is for debunking pseudo. And also, uh, as an aspect of that, telling the story of people who used to believe specific pseudoscience I focused on, and we're now out of that. Um... JS also says, I know that reasons to believe is anti-evolution, but their astronomy and geology seems to fit. Uh, that does seem to be the case. Their cosmology, astronomy, geology, all those seem to be reasonably spot on. I haven't seen anything. Now, I mean, do I go around reading all their stuff on those topics? No. But what I have read, I haven't seen as being very objectionable. Um, have you read a lot of either Biologos or Reasons? No. Um... No, back when I used to be a creationist, I, um, I mean, I saw in, in read a few things from, um, Hugh Ross, but, um, hmm. since I was in a different camp, I just kind of politely disagreed with him. I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to him and I haven't really since. Then. Okay. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, that's, that's fine. I mean, look, I don't read a whole lot of Hugh Ross. Um, although I will say, I did quite enjoy the Hugh Ross-Kent Hoven debate. Because while I disagree about with Hugh Ross about a lot of stuff, 
it was pretty obvious who had done their homework about the age of the earth, whether it was Antoven or Ross. And it was, I actually felt secondhand embarrassment. I was like, oh my goodness, this is just brutal slaughter. Um, so yeah, that was, that was fun. If you guys haven't seen that, I was just checking out. I think it was on like the John Ankerberg show or something like that. Um, which, that's a pretty old thing right there. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> not currently seeing more questions. So guys, if you have questions, do make sure that you ask. Uh, oh, here's another one from JS. What do you think of Ken Ham's Creation Museum and Ark Park? Well, <clears throat> one thing that, um, I think about Ken Ham and um, his ministry, which um, even when I used to be a young earth creationist, um, I used to think that, you know, <laughs> the, the strange thing about Ken Ham is he, he's always saying, well, it's the same evidence, different in um, in, in interpretation, but then you you know, but you have to, you have to believe it because the Bible says so. But he refuses to ever acknowledge that any other interpretation other than his own might be possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is that is an odd thing and also of course there's the fact that he doesn't look at all the evidence so it's actually different evidence um yeah that is odd and it seems like at least in the last few years more of his time has been spent harping on quote unquote like christian compromisers than it has been actually trying to get people from outside of christianity into it and so it always like the people who are donating do they notice that he's doing essentially no like evangelism per se? He's just trying to do infighting within Christianity, and does that bother them? And I mean, he keeps getting millions of dollars, so I guess not. I guess either they don't notice or they don't care. You know, some of them don't notice, and some of them don't care. Um, you know, um, Phil Vischer on his own YouTube channel was talking about this. The reason why. He and Apologia did a video was because um, that Ken Ham and, and Phil Vischer kind of got into this like Twitter spat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just got blocked. <laughs> well, hmm. <laughs> well, hmm. That is, that is interesting because, huh. You know, I mean, I almost would have expected um, Ken Ham to um, block Phil Vischer, someone who could tell people that, hey, um, you know, other interpretation of the Bible can exist. Whereas, I mean, you're just saying there's scientific evidence that disagrees with him and, um, um, you know, he can say, well, you're the outsider. But then again, I suppose... I've preemptively been blocked by a lot of uh, creationist organizations that I've never even interacted with. Like, All right. the CMI all right. Twitter already has me blocked. I've literally never tweeted at them or responded to any of their tweets, but I'm blocked. Well, then again, like you're saying, Ken Ham does use... Is, you know, he, even though he said the same number of different interpretations, it's actually different evidence because he refuses to consider some evidence. Mm -hmm. So I suppose... Um, if you were interacting with him and his Twitter followers, then some of his Twitter followers might know that he's neglected to even consider some evidence. Maybe that's why. Uh, Vandelli 1998 asks, is there anything you would have thought was a lie or like that can't be true while still a young earth creationist, but now uh, that seems so obvious that it, that it is true? Um... Well, I mean, there's lots of things that I thought couldn't be true um, in terms of, like, the age of the Earth, um, 
um, you know, did you ready metric dating and, um, you know, um, fossils that, um, lead up to us like, um, Artipithecus and other fossils. Um, of course at the time I would have just said, well, you know, um, Artipithecus is just a ape that it looks more like us and, um, Neanderthals are just a, a, a race that's now extinct. Um, <laughs> Because it's the younger creatures' viewpoints. I mean, there's lots of things that I thought couldn't be true then. Uh, I'm not sure if they seem obvious to me now, but there were lots of things that I thought couldn't be true then. Yeah. I remember for me, one of the big ones was realizing that um, Noah's flood was not a good explanation for geology, and that, like, far from it, it was more or less precluded by almost everything about geology. Um, and that was just um, just the geomorphology, right? Like that's this, this is getting into, like the heat problem. We're just like, yeah, um, you don't this get this kind of layering or these kind of sediments at the bottom of a flood. And um, I was just like, oh, so I guess there wasn't a middle flood, huh? And this, nope. Oh, okay. And that yeah, you know. seems obvious because I know more about geology. You know. On your YouTube channel, it was the first time that I heard that like, Steve Austin claims that um, a bunch of, well, soil layers were laid down with the glacier melt of Mount St. Helens. Uh, could be a miniature version of Noah's Flood. You were the first person who told me that actually those layers are showing nice strata. That's pumice. That's actually not... Um, it's actually not um, flood waters from the glacier melt. Yeah, it's it's um, that's all. Eventually, if it lithifies, that'll be subaerial tuff and not a bunch of like like sandstone and siltstone with soil horizons and whatnot. It's literally just different composition of volcanic ash, which, like I said, when it assuming it lithifies, which there's a fair chance it will, will just be tuff, which is what you call it when you have rock that's primarily composed of ash. Um, yeah, it's it's actually almost embarrassingly how badly wrong creationists like to get on Mount St. Helen. Um, JS asks, are there any YEC advocates you see as genuine? And he gives some examples. Oh, sorry, I actually heard it. They give some examples uh, of Sal Cordova, Bread of Life, and Paleologo, who I do actually think are all uh, rel they are genuine and honest uh, YEC advocates. Well, I definitely think that... Um... I definitely think that Sal Cordova is um, genuine. Um, now, Paleologos and Bear Life, I haven't really um, watched the videos, but I, I, I think they're sincere. Um, um, I don't know. I might be wrong, but I, I still think that Carball is probably sincerely deluded. I might be wrong. But I, I think that's possible. I'm, I'm probably more skeptical of it than you are, but I do think it's not impossible. Like, I, it's, it wouldn't shock me if I could somehow read his brain to find out that, no, he does believe this, although I do still think that he probably does say some things that he knows to be wrong because he feels like it's worth it just to drive home. I don't know. There was a... Um, <coughs> actually, a Professor Dave Explains video where... Um, it was showing how um, a Discovery Institute video um, basically took another documentary out of context. Oh, yeah. That was the Casey was, Luskin one, right? Yeah. Um, and you lot of like, wow, he has to... I mean, he, he took this video... From another video, and muted the audio mm -hmm. so that he could he could say the evolutions are committing fraud. Yeah, you he can. The, you have to know the explanation is, is in there because he had to watch it to do that. Right. Um, the only the only way you can get around that is to say, well, Casey Luskin wasn't the editor. It's like, okay, well, so the editor that he employs is obviously dishonest. I'm not sure how that's a much better statement. 
And I still, I think it's Casey Lester. Because my guess is that he's also the one who wrote this, which means he's the one who gave the editor his direction. Probably. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think that people like, um, well, I, even though they passed on now, Dan Gish, Henry Morris, and his son, John Morris, I think they're kind of like um, smokers who people have told them the evidence that smoke causes lung cancer, and they just refuse to acknowledge it. They just have a mental block that that can't be sure, that can't be true. Right. I could be wrong, but that's my opinion of them. Uh, so, Janice has a question. I'm going to ask it, but I do want to point out this is one of the questions that um, technically my guests are under no particular like obligation to answer because this is leaving of creationism and not anything else. Um, JS asks, are you a theist, atheist, or agnostic? Now, no need to answer if this question is too personal. Um, and like I said, we've had people who've not answered, we've had people who've answered all three of those. Any answer or no answer is fine, because this is not technically leaving Christianity or theism or anything else. It's just creation. So. Well, okay. Um, I'm still a, a theist. Recently, I've been going... Um, like more to Methodist churches and Pentecostal churches, they, they seem to do a better job of putting their money where their mouth is to help the poor as opposed to saying help the poor, but you're really just preaching to them. Yeah, like, you know, giving them you know, a hot meal and some clothes instead of a sermon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I will say, well, I mean, I'm not going to go into a, a lot of details. Um, it is funny that like when I finally realized that creation just cannot be literally correct, um, I guess evolution is true. I I was worried if the, uh, I would eventually lose faith in everything that I believed in. That really didn't happen recently. Um, I've been sick in, in a, a lot of pain because. Um, well, my mother and I owned a condo, but for work, I needed to move multiple times. And in most of these apartments, there's always someone smoking nearby. And, um, you know, it was the modern drugs for asthma. Yeah. I mean, it can keep you alive, but if the smoke is inducing an asthma attack and all these drugs are stopping it, I mean, it's really like torture, just living in constant torture pain and i have to admit having doubts if god exists recently i'll just leave it at that okay well i mean that's look there are definitely a lot of people here who are either doubt or or don't believe that god exists. so don't no one here is gonna at least i would hope not it's gonna be uh judgmental about that um so i am not currently seeing another um, thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to start doing some wrap-up stuff, and if another question comes in in the next, you know, five or six minutes, we can take that. But otherwise, we're going to start wrapping up, which means, um, I mean, are there any last things that you want people to hear or um, anything else that you feel like you haven't said that you want to? I can't think of anything um, um... What well, I I will say if, if you would be willing to put a link to Glenn Kubin's website, it's an underutilized resource. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Absolutely, could you send that to me um in our Twitter DM, and I will add it in the description. Absolutely. So what that means, guys, is it won't be there if you're watching this live just now, but it will be there very shortly, maybe during like the end credits. And if you're watching this in the future, first, hello from the past. Please don't judge us too harshly for our quaint and old-fashioned ways. Um, but that should mean that the website is there. Although if you're so far in the future, you might have to use the Wayback Machine. Or I guess maybe the Wayback Machine that shows you the Wayback Machine from the distant past. I don't know how the future is going to be. Um, hopefully better than this. <laughs> but, um, so, okay. Well, I think that is... Oh, okay, here's one from JS. Uh, which creationist is the most toxic or dis disingenuous? I can't. Hold on. Let me, let me get my words together here for a second. 
which creationist is the most toxic or disingenuous? And some suggestions are Ham, Purdom, Jeanson, MacArthur, Comfort, Hoven, Powell. Uh, no Baugh, since he was already referred to as such. Other than Baugh, who you might not think is toxic or disingenuous, who do you think is the most? Well, um... Okay, I would personally separate um, toxic and disingenuous. Yeah, me too. Um, okay, um, disingenuous. Okay, based on the limited evidence that I have seen, I would say Casey Luskin. Although, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, Dr. Dan was saying that um, uh, Jensen must know. I mean, even if Jensen believes his alternate version of genetics, he must know that that is totally incompatible with everything that he was taught in school. And so I don't know, maybe I'll give him a second, but I don't really know for sure about him. I don't really know much about Jensen, actually. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of toxic, um, I, I, mean, I would go with Kent Hovind. Um Now, it was, it's, it's interesting, though. Um, this reminds me of something that... Um, I learned about since I left Young Earth Creationism because I wasn't really paying much attention to um, pantheologies of, of the past back then. But in the the Bone Wars with um, um, oh shoot, um, I just had a brain fart. Uh, Marsh and Cope. Thank you, thank you. Yep. Um, Marsh and, and Cope. Um, okay, both of them were terrible human beings and jerks to each other. Yes, they were. Sometimes to other people. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the interesting thing is, okay, I excuse a, a lot of scientific mistakes that far back because um, it, it, we, we've learned so much more since then. I think this happened roughly in the period that Jackson Wheat would call the Eclipse of Darwinism. Um, so I don't. I kind mm. of. I don't necessarily blame um, Cope for having been um, kind of a neo Lamarckian. Um, but the interesting thing is that um, they were both terrible people. They were both horrible jerks to each other. Sometimes to others. Um, I would argue that um, Marsh was both the bigger jerk but also the better scientist because those two things are kind of separate yeah you can be a gigantic jerk a great scientist you can be you know a terrible scientist but the sweetest guy yeah so um there's a, uh, it's just an ironic fact from the past um how it seems like okay yeah more of the fossils that um at least uh, um trusted fossils maybe all the fossils that um Marsh named a like higher percentage of them are still valid. Um, and his ideas were are, are genuinely more valid in, in light of the the evidence we have today. Mm -hmm. But he was also the bigger jerk, I think. I mean, not that Cope was a nice guy. He, he wasn't. No, they were. Yes, they, my goodness. The, if you guys don't know the history of the Bone Wars, we don't have time to it now. But it's it's quite wild. Let's just say this. There were fossil beds that were exploded with dynamite after one team would leave just to stop the other team from having access to them. That's a thing that happened. It was, it was crazy and horrible and intense, but it also did result in a huge number of now famous dinosaurs being discovered. So, you know, it's, there's, there's a fixed results there. But um, I think we are going to start wrapping up. Um, unless you have anything else, I'm just going to give some quick channel announcements, and then we're going to get out of here. Um, this is another question. I think it's about it. Okay, uh, so guys, let me open up a calendar. We can take a look at what you got coming. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, let's see. On the 28th, Jackson Wheat is, I've confirmed with him earlier today, that he is going to be here for Jackson with Jackson. We talk about Dr. Charles Jackson. Then on Thursday, uh, I'm, st I'm starting to premiere a new series. It's going to be a four-part series. It's going to be the 30th. And this one is, um, it's one I actually had a fair bit of fun doing. 
One of the questions that I've had for a while is, okay, I know what ICR and CMI and AIG and whatnot are putting out, but how does that filter down to the pew in a creationist church? <clears throat> so I found some videotaped sermons about creationism and evolution and whatnot from a church that's actually not all that far from me. It's about, I think, like about four hours. It's in Arizona. Um, and so the, the pastor there gave this fairly long sermon all about uh, creationism. And uh, the friend will be, by the way, man, that is so small. I can not make out barely anything. Sorry. Man. My eyes are not good enough for, for Arabic in the tiny font that YouTube uses in the chat. Um, uh, so that's going to be a four-part series. It's starting on Thursday. Um, I am not sure what's happening on the second. I'm thinking I just continue Dapper Reacts to things, where I've been taking a look at a uh, geology talk. Not from a big-name geology guy, but from someone who was in a speaker at some creationist conference. Um, now, as far as Wednesday the 22nd, I'll top hats off. That looks like it is a go for um, the actual play of Power Rangers uh, role-playing game, Ranger Jungle Beasts. Uh, Guns, Patrick, and Steel is probably going to be on hiatus until the 20th because uh, both Erica and Luke, by the way, their wedding day is today. So, you know, um, you know, send congratulations on Twitter or, or YouTube um, comments to Erica because if she's not already married, it's going to be a matter of hours. Um, but then they're going to be sticking around for a little while and off to, uh, off to Africa. And so what it looks like right now is um, we're going to have a sort of special event for Guns, Magic, and Steel on the 20th. We're going to have a little bit of an extra long episode. We're going to do a boss fight, have some story beats, and then it'll go back on hiatus for a little bit while Maddie takes care of uh, things like, you know, having a baby. So there's a whole lot of uh, big life events happening around, like the science friends and whatnot. So, um, But for now, uh, Power Ranger Jungle Beast should be on as regular. Um, sorry that we missed the last one. Uh, the the AC went out in the house, and I was not up to standing in front of my hot computer doing that while the AC was out. So um, with that, I think that is it. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, do remember, hit like on the video if you haven't. Share it. Thank you very much, William. And we are going to get out of here with some end credits. Cool. And I put the um, I, I put Glenn Coben's website in your Twitter. Oh, awesome. Okay. I will be adding that while the end credits play. Um, do be aware, it does say not secure if you go there, so, you know. Um, all right, well, thank you very much, William, and I will see all of you guys in the chat. Hey, oh, for, anyone who's, hey for anyone who's not an expert on um, web protocols, not secure, it just means it's HTTP, it's, it's not an encrypted um, connection, uh, but it, it's not like he's selling things that he wants you to put in your credit card number for. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. And we'll see all of you hopefully on Tuesday for Jackson with Jackson. Thanks for watching. But before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Work in Progress, Ben Tovind, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Chris Love, Landon Knoll, Yepetus, Mabity Babity, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month, my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting, so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get an access to it exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wish list, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.